Audrey Taylor. I'm a plant pathologist with the uh, NDSU Williston Research Extension Center. Um, and this intercropping slash cover cropping slash everything else that's going on field day is uh, kind of the culmination of this extension risk management agency grant looking at alternative marketing and production practices for pulse crops. So please join me in welcoming Paul. Thank you, Audrey. It's great to have everybody here. And Nathan will be uh, there in the blue shirt and wave, Nathan. He'll, he'll be uh, covering the second half of the tour and we'll end up at he and Lisa's farmstead. The three fields that we're going to look at of, of mine are in your packet and there's one that says uh, sunflower pollinator intercropping. So the goal of this, last year we planted a strip of pollinators right alongside of uh, some sunflowers just to see if we would attract more, more pollinating activity, get a yield bump off of it. And it was kind of pretty. Um, but we had to give up 40, a 40 foot pass uh, a crop for the sunflowers. We did get a yield bump, but we gave up 40, 40 feet of crop to do it. So the goal this year was to plant them and get them underseeded. There's an understory of the sunflowers and see if we can get that same impact of, of the pollinators getting the, the, the plants getting the pollinating species coming to the sunflower field earlier. And, and what we chose to use were all species that could stand up to Spartan charge. So fava beans, flax, um, cow peas. What I was shooting for was about 10 to 12 plants per square foot is what we planted, okay? So they were there, but not so much that it would overwhelm the sunflowers. And, and this is the first time I've ever tried this, so, uh, and I think when we get into the field, you'll see it, it uh, didn't do too bad. One of the other things that uh, we use a, a air seeder, okay? Uh, we, we plug every other row, so we're on 15 inch centers on the air seeder to, to plant, but it's all solid seeded. And for anybody who's seeded sunflowers with an air seeder, you know that it tends to get a little bunchy, <laughs> okay? Now the planter makes nice rows. Uh, this makes it a little bit more bunchy. And so you'll see some advantages of having the pollinators when you get out there to fill in those gaps where the sunflowers didn't get, uh, didn't come up. So we seeded this at about uh, 27 pounds to the acre, cost uh, a buck a pound. So we got $27 tied up just in cover crop seed and, and then plus the uh, cost of, of seeding it. So we ended up with three, three passes running up the whole length of the field, so 120 feet wide. We use a 30 foot header, so that should work out pretty well uh, to be able to, to uh, measure the distance difference on that. And the part that's going to be interesting in this field is with the canola off on one edge, and then we will have uh, quite a gap, and then the, the pollinator species go up kind of in between these two sloughs right here, so up, up that way. And, and so there are ways away from the canola. And then on the other side of them is oats. So what I'm looking for, if I look at the yield map, I want to see if we end up with coming from the oats field and then it goes up where the uh, pollinators are planted. Maybe it'll come back down again. We'll see if it goes back up planted next to the canola because that could be a strategy too, is making sure you're planting sunflowers next to, next to a canola field, for example, if you, can, if you can swing it in your rotation. So, so we've got a lot of, you know, lots of moving parts out there to, to try and see if it works. This, this field on this side, we've intercropped uh, uh, cover crops or interseeded cover crops into it. After it was at the five leaf, it was actually just a little bit past where I wanted it. We were getting into early jointing. Um, and, and that's when we planted cover crops. We put 20 acres in here and the map that's in your handout shows how we planted it on a kitty corner. When I get into fall, my cover crops are already planted and I'm not trying to plant cover crops post harvest. And it is insurable as planted without a written agreement, without any notification, cover crops interseeded into small grains are, are an insurable crop. So we planted uh, two strips of peas and I planted those first because um, you can put them down two inches so that worked pretty well. And so we planted the peas, I planted 60 pounds in one strip and 90 pounds in the other strip. And, and the normal seeding rate for that particular variety this year was 195. So half rate, third rate as, as uh, my, my peas. And then for canola with, with my air seeder, uh, shank type air seeder, we typically seed five pounds to the acre of canola 
and, and that's what we did, although in the middle of the strip on, on both of these, I switched it down to four pounds per acre, just to see again, can we get, so the goal of this is to see if we can get like 125% of production compared to if we raised just peas or just raised canola, how many pounds would we get? Can we get 125% of, of production by raising the two of them together? Uh, so that's one goal there. The other, the other thing we did in this was I did do some uh, nitrogen uh, strips that go east-west across the field. Kind of had a miscommunication with the applicator and uh, it didn't get done quite the way I wanted to. But, but I, we'll still go in and we'll do Haney tests on these as well. Again, looking at the soil health in those, in those two strips, 60 pounds, 90 pounds, and then also using the, there's a chunk in the middle of them both that we'll use for the control. And just trying to see, are we getting any uh, additional uh, soil health benefit from the peas uh, above and beyond any potential yield increases? So that's, that's kind of my game if you haven't figured it out is soil health. And, and a lot of the stuff I'm gonna raise, the rotations we do, all of those things are all geared to how, how can we build up soil health. And, and so that, we started on this actually a long time ago, uh, 2005 when we started no-tailing, but it's, it's kind of finally coming around where we're starting to see food companies interested in, in things being raised regeneratively. Customers will be getting a, what we consider to be a higher value food product, and the farmers hopefully will be getting a little bit of a premium to go along with that and we'll start seeing the, the uh, benefits of the food chain coming together for everybody. So uh, soil health is a big, big piece of that. So no-till cover crops, crop rotation, keeping your stuff covered, uh, keeping your soil covered, all of those things that fit into that. This is a way of ensuring, I believe, uh, it, it, when you drive a combine through this, you'll just be going along and it'll be 90% soybeans and you drive 100 feet and it'll be 90% canola. And Mother Nature picks what's going to work, and it depends on rainfall, it depends on insects, it depends on all kinds of things that we can't control. And if you didn't have crop insurance, I think this is one way that you insure yourself against a lot of other things. Um, certain stages of, uh, of growth, soybeans will take hail pretty good. When they're potted, they won't take it very well at all, you know, and, and that, when you have two crops going, um, that's another, it's, you insure yourself a little bit against hail as well. So. That's, That's one reason, reason I do that. that. Similarly, Similarly, with uh, the, next the next field we go to, we'll have uh, soybeans, soybeans that were seeded green into standing rye, which was headed out at the time we seeded. And, um, and I've done that for quite a few years, and, and that's worked to varying degrees. We got a little light on our seeding rate here. I, wanted, I was shooting for eight tenths of a bushel of canola, and I know seed count matters and whatever, but I, I wanted to seed it, but we even got it on just a little lighter than that in the end. So. So this, uh, again, there's not a lot of fertility, there's not a lot of cost into this, uh, and, and no crop insurance on this, uh, no hail insurance, and so there's, there's not nearly the same, there's not nearly the cost into this as you would in a conventional system. Two things I've used to separate intercrops would be this, or I've got a quick clean, which I didn't pull out, I assume a lot of people have seen a quick clean. Uh, the thing with the quick clean is to take off the auger and let it dump out, and then those blue conveyors that we have here, we slide those underneath um, because that, that auger that goes up on the quick clean is the limiting factor and you go much faster without it if you have a lot of canola or whatever. You'll see what we have here is a, a land on the deck is uh, a trough on there and then there's a different one on the machine in the back that you'll be able to see and that's the one we use for separating so we'll just put a screen on top say we that, that the canola would fall through and that would come out the normal place of the clean grain and then we basically scalp off the top the soybeans and they'd go up the elevator here or the, the auger and into the truck or we could you can configure this thing different um, there's a variety of things you can do this is an air and screen machine so uh, there's a lot of things you can do with it. Um, it there's a lot of trial and error with it <laughs> Uh, so you have to have a good truckload to learn what you're doing. Uh, so a lot of people have seeded into rye. At this point, that's not really a new thing, but I just thought it was an interesting part of the tour because we have, uh, you know, such a difference in color. That was pretty common around here this year to have extra nitrogen left from last year. Uh, this one I don't remember. So that could have been, I mean, we may have a nodulation problem because of that, but I tend to think that the rye sucked some nitrogen out and that probably wasn't a consideration, but that's about all I can think of um, 
as to why there's such a stark difference in color. I've done this for quite a few years. The, the reason I like to do it is it's saved on herbicide. Uh, this just needed a light shot around up to kill the rye and we had no weeds coming whatsoever. This we put Roundup, uh, full rate of Roundup and Spartan pre-plant and we still had weeds coming when it was time to spray and when it was time to spray that one we couldn't hardly find a weed and uh, it, the, the rye really works good especially with um, mare's tail. It's kind of a no-till weed. It's something I never had a problem with until we started, I suppose we were eight or nine years into no-till before we had trouble or before we had any mare's tail. Uh, I think the rye is a real useful tool. There's, there's, I suppose, differences in seeding rate depending on what your goal is uh, and, and things like that. Uh, but it, it, it's, a cheap, it's a cheap herbicide to me. It re works really well on kochia and mare's tail. I, I think this has a lot of value for weed control and, and weed control is a big concern in all of agriculture right now.